Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rifle Turd channel. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about service rifle shooting. Now, what is service rifle shooting? Well, essentially, what service rifle shooting is, is let me just uh, clear here. So service rifle shooting is, um, in my opinion, one of the only real opportunities your typical average Joe is going to be able to expose himself to a level of marksmanship, uh, if interactive marksmanship, um, where your skills are going to have a significant chance of a kind of broadening the detail, scope, and magnitude of your skill base. It is a huge learning opportunity to, uh, to involve yourself in service rifle shooting. And I kind of came, came across it haphazardly, as it were, because I was, you know, I was the rifle chairman of my local club, and I was, uh, that's how I got my name, rifle chair, rifle chairman. Uh, I did that for like 11 years, and I, I wanted to start a vintage service rifle competition just once a year and it, it grew and it grew and it got to be more of a kind of a regional competition it started with very very basic targets you know shooting at an eight inch circle at 100 meters in the standing kneeling and prone position and different serials and so on but i didn't know anything about service rifle competition at the time it's just a, a field that interested me and then the military happened okay and then i'm not saying if I don't want to talk too much about the military, but but what they did was give me a bit of a boost on my on my knowledge of this whole service rifle competition business and what it, what it's really about and just the, the the immense opportunity to learn and that really opened my eyes. Okay, it really opened my eyes to the world of shooting. It's just um, incredible. The, the 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 room for personal growth is absolutely phenomenal and um, so I would encourage anybody to do it now there's a few things that you need to know about before you get involved in surface rifle shooting it's kind of uh, generally these these competitions are hosted by people that have spent time in the military because this this is one of the only place last places in the world where uh, this this type of shooting is, is still done there's different organizations where there's the Dominion of Canada Rifle Association that have kind of adopted the military principles of matches 1 to 12 and so on, uh, where we're shooting at targets very similar to this. And other uh, provincial rifle associations, this is in Canada, such as the, um, the British Columbia Rifle Association, the Alberta Rifle Association, the Ontario Rifle Association. And they all have their own kind of service rifle, kind of, should we say, uh, wing Right? There's F-Class, there's Precision, there's Tactical Rifle, all these different divisions that are underneath these, these shooting associations. Service Rifle is, is pretty much consistently from province to province, and then at the national level, uh, they exist across, across the Canada, federally and provincially. Now, they also use templated military ranges to, to host their, their competitions. You pretty much have to. Some are, are still in yards, such as the Nanaimo Range in Vancouver Island, where you'll be shooting in yards, not in meters. And you, you need to know the difference if you're going to be shooting at targets at different distances, if you're on a metric range or one of the older imperial ranges. Okay. And uh, so you, um, while you're in these areas and you're shooting on these beautiful, fantastic ranges, you're shooting at moving targets, pop-up targets, uh, deliberate matches where you're taking every time de developing and deploying the principles of surgical precision to get that perfect shot to snap shooting and and rapid fire serials at all of these different ranges from you know from 25 meters out, out to 500 meters and sometimes in some cases further depending on which match you're going to be attending and and these uh, peer uh, provincial rifle associations or the DCRA matches you're shooting with military members and you're shooting with civilian members who may have been once upon a time in the military and and just want to get back into shooting those kinds of matches because they, they've 
they reflect on them very fondly and they, they still love to do it. To all, all the way down to people who have never been in the military, have never shot service rifle before, and they're giving it their first shot, giving it the first try. Now those those are people that that um, when you when you're on the range, and if you know that there's a newbie there or a tyro there, is that we uh, we try to you know um, help them so that they understand, um, make sure that they understand what the range commands are going to be, that everything's going to be safe for them. You know they may have an assistant range safety office officer kind of hover around that person to kind of okay yeah he knows he knows he he knows the the range commands. He knows um, safe handling drills, all that different kind of stuff. That's why assistant range safety officers are so important. Right? So we try to groom these people to, to help them and, and allow them to develop and, f- and hone their craft in service rifle shooting. And, uh, you know, there's, there's one other aspect, which is to, which is to kind of place that, shoot, that shooter under a, a modicum of stress so that... Um, they may not do so well the very first time they do it, but they won't generally make those mistakes a second time. So it's continually this this uh, continuous improvement of the development of that person's marksmanship. Now, one of the problems that people have when it comes to um, service rifle shooting, especially if you're starting off and you've never done this before, is uh, the difference between making personal time or if you're doing it on company time. Whether you're a member, for example, there's lots of members of the RCMP. Uh, I've seen uh, members of the um, uh, Department of Federal Fisheries and Oceans. I've seen uh, conservation officers at these matches and they've, uh, they're have they obviously shooting with the support of their unit. Okay, there's obviously uh, military members, they're in uniform, they're shooting this. They're, uh, they're obviously shooting these matches as as an extension of the unit with the support of their unit. And so for those uh, people who are, are civilian shooters, A, they're not, they're not getting a wage. Uh, the, um, the other members that are shooting with the support of the unit, they're obviously insured because they're on company time. Um, they don't have to worry about b- purchasing their own factory ammunition. right? They're supplied with ammunition. They might be even, be even supplied with the rifle. So they're, their own personal costs are well next to nothing. I mean, their accommodations are paid for. Their their food is paid for. Okay, the transportation quite often is paid for, and so they are shooting with the support of the unit, and they are so lucky to have that kind of um, opportunity available to them, to, for for them to develop their own personal craft and marksmanship. But for the rest of us who aren't in the military. We have to we have to ante up and pay for all of those things so that we can attend those matches, and it is expensive. The the, the purchase of your rifle, the the making, the hand tailoring of your ammunition, or the purchase of your ammunition, your optical um, and mounting systems, um, the the clothing that you're wearing, your your hotel bills, your your the restaurant fees, right? I mean your your plane ride, the the gasoline and and the insurance on your vehicle that you're paying and your time off of work, leave without pay or whatever it is that you're doing. Those are the people who um, who have made a great personal investment into the pursuance of their de- of their marksmanship development. And it's also about camaraderie, getting together with certain uh, people, uh, personalities, um, the sharing and transfer of knowledge is so important. This, this kind of the social inter- interaction of these marksmen when they uh, when they get together. There's a, there's a cadre of credible marksmen in every organization, whether it's provincially or federally or in the military and the law enforcement community. Is that when they get together, they are able to speak about this this hemisphere of knowledge, right, and share that and expand people on different things. Um, also, when you're when you're shooting on the on these military ranges, it's not just the social aspect of it afterwards over a beer, kind of recounting the day, um, how your mental framework was was not really helping you because your 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 mind plays a lot of tricks on you when you're um, in competition, but um, but also your ability to socialize afterwards and relax and really dissect surgically dissect your day and then recount it. 
as to when things didn't quite go so well for you, as to how you're going to make sure that doesn't happen again, right? And the reasons for that. Could maybe it's the pressure. You've got 20 people to your to your left. You've got 20 people to your right. There's range commands coming at you. You're supposed to be performing certain functions. If you're not in the moment, if you haven't projected, visualized what you're supposed to do ahead of doing it, then your, your performance probably isn't going to be that great. It's just the mental conditioning that you, you put yourself through so that you can focus on what's important, which is your sight picture and the squeeze of that trigger rather than worrying about what's happening around you necessarily. It's called getting inside your bubble. Um, Gunny, um, what, who said that again? Carlos Hathcock, I think he referred to it as getting inside his bubble, right? He excludes all information or you know what's going on around him. All there is is the target, his breathing, and the marksmanship. So trying to find that place as a marksman so that you can, you can develop your craft in a perfect manner with all these distractions around you, that is service rifle. And then you run 100 meters and your heart is pounding, you're sweating, and your glasses are fogging up. All right? And you're trying, to, you're trying to engage a target that is moving from left to right at a pace at 300 meters. Right? I mean, these are the kinds of things that we do in service rifle. And um, I, I would recommend it to anyone for their personal understanding, growth, and in many ways, in many ways, to understand yourself, to get to know yourself. Um, now, there's so many other things about service rifle shooting I'd like to talk to you about. However, I understand these videos sh can, should only be so long. It's a subject of, of interest for me, always has been, and uh, I know it is for a lot of you too. One of the other aspects of this which is people that have done this in the past and they may never do it again, is that they took it to such a high level of personal development and recognition amongst that cadre of professionals, um, the cadre of credible marksmen, is that those names and faces, you never forget them. And there's a, a mutual respect and understanding uh, from those people that will continue with you as you as you age, as you grow, uh, and as you personally develop. Whereas some of those people, where they are able to take that craft and and uh, and develop to the extent where they become national champions, is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, fantastic character of people. That's who they are. And they're driven by something very special. And that needs to be nurtured. Now, what I also would, would recommend to anybody who's interested in service rifle shooting is that you utilize a rifle, which is going to be in good uh, mechanical condition. It's going to be an accurate rifle. And then you focus, I'm not saying Lee Enfield, just whatever rifle you choose, is that you focus all of your attention on shooting just that rifle and you develop your your um, your understanding of the rifle okay when you shoot in a specific load that you that you've developed or that you've acquired as to um, and it's okay to do this is to write it like maybe on a on a bullet patch or something like that you can write down at uh, what your come ups are at certain ranges put it on a sticker stick it on your rifle but ultimately you you memorize it so that you can sit there and just lift your rear sight and count the clicks, you know, you're good for 400 now, right? And knowing how to range, uh, read range flags when getting to wind, that's, that's, a, that's a subject for a totally different video. But yeah, you will need to be able to read the flags and understand wind and all that different stuff too. But really ultimately where you need to start is to get your, yourself a, um, a rifle platform that will, that will allow you to practice and that you know you can rely on and it's not going to have any problems or, you know, this needs to be repaired. This isn't functioning properly. No, it needs to be 100% functional and reliable and accurate. Okay. And um, you, uh, you need to learn that rifle. You need to dedicate a book to just that rifle. For example, you know, I've got this book that I developed that I put together for one of my rifles. It is dedicated to that rifle. There's another video out there on the shooting record book, but it's it's got everything I need in it. I mean, I've got uh, come-ups for, uh, for uh, 
shooting in, uh, in Chilliwack at the BCRA. I've got uh, come-ups for shooting in Nanaimo, which is in, 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 in yards. I know exactly how many click intervals I need for a specific ammunition lot, okay? From 100 all the way up to 500 meters, which is also 547 yards. Um, I got all of my targets in here for where I was aiming on the target that day because of wind. So, let's see here on... What's it? Uh, 100, 100... 200, 300, got a headache, I got a, had a migraine headache that day, but here's at 500 yards. My point of aim is here, because that's what I can see. I'm at the 6 o'clock position of a 4 foot frame, because that's what I can see. And when you're shooting with open sights at 500 yards, you can't see much of the target. You certainly can't see the figure 1259 here in the center of the target, but you can see the four foot frame, you know, you make sure you get the right one that's in your lane. <laughs> but that's my point of aim on that day at 500 yards for that target and I record every single bullet strike. What I'm doing is I'm developing, I'm building a data set for one specific rifle. You need to be able to do that for the one rifle you're going to be shooting in service rifle. I'm very fortunate to have had the opportunity to do all of this with the uh, number four Lee Enfield rifle. I will continue to do so. I've uh, I've always kind of wanted to shoot it with the AR-15. However, uh, opportunities to practice uh, are systematically reduced with an AR-15 because in Canada they're restricted, and you have to go to a, um, a licensed rifle range in order to discharge them. So for a non-restricted rifle, it just opens up so many more practice opportunities, and you don't have to worry about your authorized uh, authorization to transport. Incidentally, if you're going to be shooting in a military range, you may need a special provision on your ATT because uh, some military ranges aren't, well, aren't, will not be listed as as a, as a, as, a, as, a, as a civilian licensed range. And so you may need to get a um, an addendum to your ATT to shoot on a military range if you're a civilian shooting a, a civilian restricted rifle. So anyway, um, I don't want to belabor the point too much. Um, other than to also say one very last thing is that if you're going to be shooting something like this or, you know, people have shot it with things like 762 by 30, 39 rifles chambered in that caliber and so on is that quite often what they may want to do is go out to the bush and shoot at steel like this one here. And, uh, but you're kind of limited as what your range is going to be if you're going to be shooting on an austere range out in the bush so you, if you can do it safely please do it safely. I've made a video on that as well. It's not an extensive list of safety items to consider, but it's a place to start. Is that if you're going to be shooting at stuff like this, especially with, with metal jacketed bullets or maybe armor piercing tungsten cores, is that this AR-500 steel will cause sparks. And if you're in a, an extreme or very high forest fire hazard areas, sparks coming off of your uh, steel like this onto grass or something like that, it causes fires. It happens on railways all the time. That's the reason why they uh, they like to devegetate areas around railway lines is because you know those those steel wheels hitting the hitting, hitting the uh, the railway line it causes sparks. Well, it's, it's 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 worse in many ways with with steel jacketed ammunition on on shooting at steel in the bush. Right, it causes lots of sparks. So you need to be cognizant of that. But do do whatever you can to develop your personal skill. Your mental conditioning, right? It's 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 a it's a massive massive part of it. And visualizing what you're going to do before you do it. Make sure you understand the serial that you're shooting. You know all of the steps. You've run it through your head multiple times. That takes time. It takes effort, and it takes practice. Right? Service rifle shooting. It is like a big deal. I highly recommend it. Give it a try. And if you you know if you've been there, done that, you had a good time doing it, didn't you? And those are fond memories. Hope you're all doing well. Ralph Church sending off, and as always, Maple Leaf up.